have everything together, do we? <laughs> Some worse than others, but we don't have it all together. And thank God that salvation is by grace. Is that good? Is that good? Salvation is not accomplishment. It's not one spiritual activity stacked on another religious deed and three good works in a row and church on Sunday. And that if you string all that together, one day God says, well, you've made it now. And I'll count you down as saved. Hmm. Now, the world is full of religions who teach their people that way. We stand alone, those who believe the Bible and take it in its context, we stand alone against all world religion. No one out there is like us. If they were like us, they'd be us. But we believe that salvation is a birth. It doesn't come by accomplishment. Could you imagine a father going nervously to his wife who's about to bear their first child, and he sort of gets down right towards the womb and he starts talking to that baby inside, and he's like, hey, hey, little guy in there, hey, this is your daddy. I just need to talk to you for a minute because we want you to always do everything correctly. We're going to do everything right. We want you to achieve in life, little one, and we need to get something from you. We need to know about your commitment to obeying everything we tell you to do, and we need your dedication to your school life and your social life. We don't want you to embarrass the family, right? We can't have that. So we need to get this from you in writing, and if you can't sign the papers about your commitment and success, well, then we're not going to let you out. Could you even imagine? That's absurd. But this is exactly the approach that people who teach an error-filled doctrine called lordship salvation believe in. That essentially, it's not enough to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved, but you have to also commit your whole life, every area of your life has to be surrendered to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And I have news for you. Those who actually believe that really can't know that they're saved. You can't have assurance like we talked about last night. You know why? Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I could even say, well, I know every area of my life right now is committed to the Lord, this area, that area, that area. But I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or three years from now. Or if my best friend dies in a car wreck, how will I see God? Lordship salvation is error because it doesn't present salvation as a birth, but as the maturity of a full-grown spiritual specimen. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? Because there's a great big difference in salvation by grace and salvation by law. There's a great big difference in salvation being by faith alone in Christ alone and salvation coming by mixing faith in Christ plus good works and obedience. Now, if you want to believe that salvation only comes by faith in Jesus plus good works plus obedience, welcome to the world religions. Go get you some. Because there are so many people who agree with you. But I'm of a different mind. That's what Pastor Wally's ministry has always been about. Making the gospel of Jesus Christ clear and simple. That salvation is like a baby being born. Babies don't pay the price to be born. Mom and dad pay that hospital bill, about $9,000. But the baby gets it for free because someone else provides. Is that good news for you tonight? But this process of maturing takes some time. Tonight, I'm asking you to consider that you are no longer a baby in life, but that you have gone over a threshold. That's what I'm asking tonight. This is what dedication is about. It's recognizing, hey, I'm ready for the next step with God. I know I'm saved. That's God's gift to me. It's by faith in Christ alone, and I know that's a description of me. I know I can't save myself. I can only trust Jesus for that. Okay, so I'm born. 
And now what's next for me as I mature as a believer in Jesus? And in a crowd this size, I'm thinking that some of you recognize, hey, God has been fingering you this week. And tonight it's going to all come down to an invitation at the end of this message that you let everyone in the building know, I'm standing up for Jesus Christ. He has stood by me. He's proven it. He's the one who's proven himself to me. Therefore, since I can fully, ultimately trust him, I'm going to give him my life. I'm going to give him the rest of my life. I want to dedicate my life as a believer in Jesus who's maturing beyond birth, beyond being a toddler, beyond being a child. I, I want to go on to what's next. And so your next step then would be dedicating your life. Now, this is not something tonight that I'm going to ask you to do silently, quietly. And when it comes time to believe in Jesus Christ, I do that quietly and silently. Because I don't want to confuse an unsaved person with a whole lot of foo for all. I don't want to confuse them. I don't want them thinking, oh, I got to go forward. What if, what if, what if I fall? What will all my friends think if I go for? I don't want them thinking about all that. I don't know why preachers do that. It's so totally unnecessary and often confusing. So when I want an unsaved person to be born again, quietly, silently, all I want them to think about is their need, their desperate need to believe in Jesus Christ as their way, truth, and life. Is that good? But now your dedication, see, this is about living your life among other people as someone who's dedicated to the Lord. So that's not something you can do quietly, right? Because, I mean, it's out loud living in a world full of people, about 8 billion strong now. So at the end of this meeting is going to come an opportunity for you to very loudly make a presentation that you are dedicating your life tonight to the Lord. So I'm giving you this in advance. It's all up straight, no curveballs tonight. I'm throwing it right down the middle for you. That's how the meeting will end, with a chance for you to stand and to come forward, and everybody in the building will see you saying, I'm, I'm going the next step with God. I'm dedicating myself. I am not ashamed. I'm ready to be bold for God. That's how we end tonight. In my own life, I trusted Christ my Savior when I was somewhere between five years old and eight years old. Five was when Mama taught me John 3.16. Eight was when I was with a little gospel track, quietly, silently, no other human around. And I read it, and I understood everything in it, that I was a sinner. My penalty was death. Jesus paid that death penalty for me and rose from the dead to prove it. If I'd put my faith in him, I'd be saved. I'd have eternal life. I know I trusted Christ that day, if not before, when I was five. All free, all by grace, only through faith in Jesus. Shortly after that, the church that I was born into split. And those people hurt my mom and dad a lot, so I didn't grow up in a church. Boy, did that ever hurt me, too. I heard messages my daddy would lead us around the kitchen table. Because pretty much they were afraid of going to church because they didn't want to be hurt by people anymore. So daddy would lead us. Isn't that a shame? Listen, if you're ever in a church and they're fussing and fighting and talking about splitting, please consider the children who will be <laughs> losing the game because grown people couldn't get along in church. We would sometimes, a lot of times, listen to a radio preacher, and he'd always have these seven-point outlines. Man, it's just completely not understandable by a kid. That was me, not understanding. I loved God, make no mistake. I loved God. I wanted to do great things for God, and I knew I was saved. But, boy, I just didn't get any good feedings. You know, I, did, I didn't have a good workout of, of my spiritual body because I couldn't understand the truth. I never had anybody like Wally Murillo in my life at that time. 
And boy, did that ever slow my roll spiritually. I grew intellectually when I was in third grade. They said I was gifted. I was in a gifted program. When I was in high school, I met a man who was true blue. His name was Coach John Martin. I think he would have cut an arm off for me. And he trained me in the scriptures. And I was with him in a Bible study one night. I was stretched out on a carpet floor. I'm going to show you the verse tonight that I looked at that rocked my world and changed my life. I had read those verses before, but on that night, it's kind of like they were looking back at me. And I knew that night, look, Freddie, he's proved himself to you. And you ought to give him the rest of your life. Since Jesus is so trustworthy, I knew, look, I ought to give him my life because he can manage it better than I can. It, it only made sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? That was simply what it came down to for me to dedicate my life. Knowing my life is better in his hands than in mine. He's stronger than I am, smarter than I am. He knows more than I do. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills and the hills too. He's big enough and strong enough and wise enough and got stuff enough to manage my life. Why would I manage it myself when I'm so limited? And so that night I was crying because it was so cool to understand this for the first time ever. And I just knew I, I, I got it. I, I found this. This is the key to the rest of my life is in dedicating myself to the one I know I can trust more than I can trust myself. And I just put my face down in the Bible and down on that carpet that night and just cried a little bit and dedicated my life to the Lord. Is that good? That's my story. But today, people are growing up with no orientation towards God. Even though we didn't have a church, I had mama. And I had two brothers older than I was. I mean, if I fiddled around, fooled around, if I'd ever, if I'd ever like come home, had alcohol on my breath, they'd have killed me my two brothers. I couldn't stand the thought of, of shaming my mom in that way. So I, I had their presence. And there was always this orientation about God. But today, so many people, and, and I think probably a lot of you, have you've grown up and you're not really oriented to God. What I mean is this, that you, all your life, have lived in the center of everything. You are to you the center of your world. Everything's about you. I love you, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. It's just time to face the truth. It was a great day in my life when I realized these things. I am not the center of this world. I'm just a little bitty itsy piece somewhere that, thank God, God gave me life. I'm like a piece of dust on the page. But thank God, God loved me, and Jesus died for that little piece of dust on the page. Mm -hmm. But for some of you, it's time to grow up. It's time to realize you really are not the center of everything. The, the world doesn't revolve around you. And you need to get out of the wah wah stage and quit thinking that you're owed in life. There's only one thing that we're owed hell. And if any one of us ends up a half step short of hell, then we can say, I got blessed by God because hell had my name written all over it as a sinner. It's time to not feel owed anymore. It's time to feel blessed. The Bible says his mercies are brand new every morning. If the sun is up, God has mercy for you. But there will come a time the sun won't rise on your world. I hope that you've been born again by that day. But tonight, for some of you, the bell is ringing. The bell is a wake-up call. It's time to go to the next level. I'm so glad that that time came in my life. But because there's no no orientation towards God so much in the world today. People just don't have God on their radar. People don't think, some of you, you really never have thought about God. In fact, I talked to someone today who told me that someone in their cabin told them, I, 
I've never thought about God in my life. This is what I'm talking about. No orientation toward God. It's like being lost out there on the, on the trail somewhere on a bluff and you don't have a compass and you don't know which way the sun is. You just have no bearing. You don't know how to get back. And they're teaching evolution that there's no God that everything in the universe got here because there was a bang. Can I talk to you just for a minute about this? Because this is such nonsense. And I don't know how on earth people have put up with it for so long. There was nothing. There was no time. There was no space. There's no mass. There's no energy. There's none of that. There's nothing. And it blew up. That is absurd on its face. When will, when will those students be like, what? This is crazy. Did you go to college? That's absurd. When has nothing ever blown up? I mean, how do you do that? How can nothing blow up? And they grow up thinking, oh, really? Yeah, okay. So nothing blew up and we all got here. That's absurd. Another theory's come along to expose the absurdity of that theory that they now have taught for about 40 years. It's being replaced. Because, in fact, there have been a bunch of students who are raising their hand in class and said, excuse me, sir, ma'am, but that doesn't make sense to me when you say there was no time, there's no energy, and there's no stuff. How did that blow up? Hee, hee, hee. And they had no answer. So now what they've done is introduced stuff. You know what they're saying? There was something. In fact, it was the whole universe condensed into a little tiny ball the size of a period. Just lately, they've changed the little period to something the size of a tennis ball. They're saying that everything in the universe was condensed into the size of a tennis ball. It was very hot and it was very heavy. Does that sound absurd to you? I can't even get all my socks to fit in my drawer. How do they get everything in the universe into a little bitty ball? If you believe that, I just feel sorry for you. I think the only reason that anybody would ever accept that as the origin of the universe is they're absolutely terrified that God is real. And when we're so terrified, we'll do anything to our brains to get some relief for what we fear. But do we have to be afraid of God just because he's so strong? Just because he's so wise? Does that mean we have to be so afraid of him that we don't want him to exist? What if he's a benevolent God? What if he's full of love? What if it's true that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Who would want a God like that to not be real? I can tell you what your theory is of the creation of the universe. It's one of two things. You believe in a big bang caused by nothing, or you believe in God. That's all you got. You've got God as the first cause of everything else, or you have nothing as the cause. What will you go to bed with tonight in your head? When you begin to get God in your thinking, then you can begin to grow in your academic process. Hopefully towards believing in Christ as your Savior. And then spiritually you begin to move from birth, that you grow through childhood, and you reach a time that you do the math and you come to a point like I did that you realize, hey, he has proven himself to me. I'm going the next step with Jesus. I'm dedicating my life to him. Why do more of us not do more than what we're doing? All our lives, we were in the center of earth. But it's time to think about other people. 
That's what dedication is for. You wouldn't be alone if you do this. I'm going to Mark chapter 1. If you got your Bible there, I hope you do. It's a day on the coast at the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is walking down that coast. He already has met these two young men. Their names are Simon and Andrew. He met Andrew some time ago, and Andrew knew he's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. Put his faith in Jesus and quickly first thought of others. Andrew is a kid who doesn't think of himself as the center of earth. As soon as he got who the Messiah is, he first went and found his brother, whose name was Simon, and he, he literally brought him to Jesus, telling him, I found a Messiah. Simon is also going to be called Peter, if you know who that is in the Bible. Well, now, having both of them believed in Jesus and been born into everlasting life, now Jesus is going to talk to them this morning on the coast at the Sea of Galilee as they're on the boat and Jesus is walking along. Imagine this in your mind while I read it. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. When we talk about being dedicated to the Lord, that is not at all a call to be a preacher or like a music director or any vocational call like that. You see, there are dedicated people who live in all kinds of jobs, situations. These guys are just fishing, but they're believers and they're growing in their faith. And on this day, Jesus sees them doing what they do for a job, 17. And Jesus said unto them, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Now listen carefully to this. Come ye after me is not a thing to be said to unsaved people so they'll become saved. To an unsaved person, you would say, believe in Christ. Well, they've already done that. So their message is for service. Jesus wants them, since they're, they're, they're people, they're, they're walking, they're talking, they're understanding, and they're growing. So he says, hey, get off that boat. Come after me, and I'll do something for you. Stay on the boat, and he's not going to do it. But you come off that boat and come after me. I will make you, he says, to become fishers of men. 